This is a program that discusses issues of faith for people looking for answers. This is Viewpoint with Bob Placey. Law enforcement is under fire for more than just weapons. Many in our nation are demanding an overhaul of the men and women who serve in blue. Today we're going to introduce you to a chaplain who the first responders call the Rev. John Ravel is a pastor and author, but his passion is ministering to the first responders in his hometown in Southwest Connecticut. Today I'll ask him about the stories we don't often hear of the trauma and pain that first responders go through and how through John's work he's bringing peace to those brave men and women in his hometown. My father was indeed a Marine in the South Pacific during mm -hmm. World War II. And when I was young, he was a police officer. And so I, when I first met our police chief here in Stanford, I uh, had explained that and said, I've always had a, a great relationship with veterans and cops. And right there on the spot, he said, would you be our chaplain? And I said, <laughs> okay, I guess. It fits, it fits. Yeah. But growing, growing up in that home, uh, your dad was a pastor down in Mississippi and some of the toughest times in our history in, in that, part of the, that part of the country, uh, how'd that kind of prepare you for the chaos that you see at times? Well, as, again, when you look back at God's work over the course of time, you're amazed at how he, his sovereign plan weaves it all together. Uh, but yeah, I, I observed um, very overt racism uh, firsthand. Mm -hmm. uh, we were in northeast Mississippi in a rural community. And it was very common for uh, my friends, my white friends, to be very, very vocal in their, uh, their open uh, bigotry. And my father, on the other hand, was very passionate in his opposition to racism. And in fact, uh, a local sheriff was known to be a high-ranking member of the, the Klan huh. and uh, actually threatened his life because of that. And so we, we got to see that very firsthand, the days of... Uh, the story of Mississippi burning and Dr. King's assassination. So you were there then, and, and your, your dad's standing up to, uh, to in this case, uh, not just saying, hey, if, if, they want, if they want me, they can come and get me kind of thing, because he's a tough Marine. How'd that really prepare you for that, that, uh, that mindset of people that are really first responders, uh, putting their life on the line in a, in, a, in a regular basis? Well, see, that was my model. And I, I thought everybody was like that, uh, ready to face the tough challenge, uh, challenges, ready to sacrifice. And as I grew up and got into uh, real life, I understood that that was not the case. But with first responders and, and particularly uh, police and firefighters, uh, the, the phrase has become a cliche, but it's so true. When everybody else is running away from disaster, they're running head on into it. And so as part of their daily regimen, they are uh, preparing themselves to lay their lives down for the sake of uh, the citizens whom they serve. Yeah. Well, that, what you saw then, I mean, a lot of your, your growing up days prepared you for what you're doing now, but there were a lot of things in between. I mean, you went off to, a, uh, to, to college in Miami, and you served in a lot of churches. That really prepared you from the ministry standpoint, didn't it? Yeah. I. Um, uh, I realized early on God had given me a pastor's heart. And uh, the thing that I do with cops and first responders is I just care. I'm, I'm a professional carer. <laughs> and uh, it shows. The, the, the police chief uh, early on, uh, after a critical incident happened, one of our officers almost died uh, in an accident. And he called me up early one morning and I went to the hospital and, and the Lord miraculously uh, delivered him. But my wife and I followed up taking meals uh, to the house and getting to know them. And the police chief, who is a, a salty old uh, crusty veteran cop, uh, started in New York City. And their language uh, up here is not quite like the Bible Belt. Uh, but uh, he said, you're the you're the first chaplain 35 years of police work you're the first chaplain i know that gives a blank and i said well that's not the way it's supposed to be and he said unfortunately that's the way it is so i just i care uh, and so the lord's preparation in being a pastor has served me incredibly well in caring for hurting people how do you cut through all that i mean when you've got uh, there's a resistance there and uh because in this case you're sharing life with them i mean people that have uh 
could be on their deathbed, but you're sharing real life with them and their, their extended family. How do you cut through all that resistance to where they see the fact that uh, you really are bringing them the heart of Christ? Yeah, it's not easy. And uh, I've been told that, that it is a difficult fraternity to become uh, a part of. And first, when Chief announced that I was going to be the chaplain, there was an overwhelming lack of being impressed. <laughs> <laughs> no one really uh, showed any interest in it. There was a, it was very closed. But the incident that I mentioned to you about the officer who was uh, seriously injured, uh, when I went into that, uh, that waiting room to meet the wife, there were a, a number of cops sitting with her, and they all looked at me as if there were daggers in their eyes, like, uh, who is this guy, and why is he here, and what's he want to do? They had no idea that I was the chaplain. Feel like you were, feel myself. like you were invading their privacy? Yeah. Yeah, one guy thought I was an insurance person showing up uh, to talk about the insurance policy. And so he was ready to, I found out later, he was ready to physically remove me. Uh, but I prayed with her, and then I prayed with, with uh, uh, the officer the next day, and they were there several times when Debbie and I showed up. And that started to ease things, and, and there started to be a, a little more openness. But then when Sandy Hook happened, uh, so many of our, yeah. our officers were involved in the uh, escorts for the funerals, and, and some ha were related to individuals who had passed away. And I served with some of uh, our officers in Stanford for two weeks uh, multiple days going up and being there in the escorts. And that's when uh, the wall started coming down. I mean, the media covered it for weeks, the trauma and the tragedy of, of Sandy Hook and, and you being, what, 35 miles away. Something that you don't hear about in the media, something that we don't know, maybe only the families, the first responders really know the truth. But tell us a little bit about the impact that it had on the first responders themselves and then how it affected those people who were ministering to them, people like yourself. Yeah, it was probably the most difficult uh, time that many of us have ever experienced. I was not on the front lines ministering to the Newtown police officers, uh, but the Lord opened the door for, uh, for me to minister to a couple of first responders who uh, had had to be on the scene and do that investigation. And the emotional trauma and, as I mentioned, the moral injury, the spiritual trauma, is just uh, unfathomable. It, uh, you, you don't, there's no way to prepare yourself for uh, witnessing the consequences of that level of evil. We're just not geared for that. And so a couple of the first responders that I uh, ministered to immediately, uh, they were traumatized by it. They had uh, this. This was four days later, five days later, and they were still in uh, in a almost a stupor. Uh, but then, ever s since, I have spoken with, uh, and that was uh, what eight years ago, coming up on eight years ago, I've spoken with first responders who had to process the scene, and they still bear the scars. It, that's not something that you can. You can get to the point where you're able to function, you're able to, to live life, and it doesn't have to cripple you, but it's not something you totally get over. And for chaplains and uh, uh, spiritual care providers, for emotional care providers, I know uh, a friend of mine uh, helped the, those police officers go through it, and he was, he was scarred by it. It's... It is a, just an, uh, an inconceivable le level of emotional and spiritual trauma. But the Lord has made us such that time heals. And combined with that, what I mentioned about uh, sharing the burden with others, God's design is amazing. And when we apply biblical principles of bearing one another's burden, and showing compassion for those who are hurting. And the Lord uses that to bring healing. So there is hope for, for those who experience that level of trauma. 
You talk about critical incidents, incidences and being prepared for that and, and things like, I mean, the horrific thing of, of Sandy Hook and, and stuff like that and the crime going on now in New York City. But uh, you also talk about uh, uh, just the, the, the damage, not PTSD necessarily, but the damage to the, the, the moral fiber of some of these yes. people when they, when they encounter things, see things, witness things, or do them things themselves that, that are opposed to them the, their own moral upbringing. How do you how do you minister to somebody like that? And and can you get him back on the street? Yeah, it's and that's the encouraging uh, point is that there is hope for somebody who has been harmed that way. Just like there's physical trauma and emotional trauma, they're starting to recognize now that there's spiritual trauma, soul trauma, and the the remedy or the the treatment is talking about it with a, a person of faith, a, a clergy, uh, in, a, in my case, a, a chaplain. And when there's so much healing that takes place in just talking and sharing a burden, a phrase that I've used many times, I heard it in our own marriage counseling when we were about to get married, but a joy shared is doubled, but a burden shared is halved. And so often when somebody has gone through that kind of horror, just being able to talk about it with somebody yeah. helps ease that pressure. And then they ask hard questions, like why would God allow this kind of situation? If he's truly a good God, why would he allow this? And so it really opens the doors for conversations. Viewpoint is now in its third season. Our mission at Viewpoint is to present a better understanding of how the Bible is relevant in our lives. If you enjoy this program, please support it with a monthly financial gift so we can continue to reach the world with the good news. Not only can you watch Viewpoint each week, but you can also listen to it on demand as a podcast. You can go to WTLW.com and under videos, click Viewpoint, and you'll see the selection of interviews. You can also subscribe by searching for Viewpoint with Bob Placey on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. And remember to share the podcast with your friends. With the, with the increasing tensions between police and certain communities in the United States, I mean, it's, it's at a critical point in, in, in the nation. We've got all kinds of things going on. God has called you to step in with yet another ministry in, in building community and in, 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 in building, rebuilding things together. Tell us about that. That's, that's an amazing ministry. Yeah. Again, it is a, uh, it's another illustration of God's sovereign uh, plan his providence working together. This was not something that I envisioned. A local uh, Fortune 500 company in Stanford uh, actually invited me to participate. The uh, senior uh, vice president at the time heard me speak at a, a men's gathering, and he said, I have an idea. And this was in the, the tense days right after the forming of Black Lives Matters and, and some of the situations uh, that occurred then. He said, our philanthropic uh, approach, strategy, is to go into communities and do repair jobs on low-income uh, homes. What if we got police officers involved with that? And I said, I think that's great. And so in uh, fall of 2015, we did our first one in Stanford. And then September of uh, 16, we did another. They bought out another Fortune 500 company, and their footprint expanded. And they said, would you be our national liaison with police departments across the country wow. to do this? And so in April of 2017, we had our first combined event outside of Stanford where we bring the police officers and uh, the community members together for a dinner on Friday night. And then the police officers help with the repair project on Saturday. And that, and what I shared with them is, when you have two people who voluntarily break bread together and then sweat together, it tears down barriers and builds bridges. And we've seen that happen. We've had 23 events in 30 months uh, from wow. that April event through October of uh, 2019. Do you, do you feel 
when they walk into this this dinner the the night before the event, they they're going to share a meal. You feel a, that the tension is palpable, and that <laughs> and that it, that it kind of fades away as they sit down and eat together. To say the least, <laughs> uh, consistently, uh, particularly in in cities like St. Louis and, and Charlotte, yeah. there is a lot of uh, caution and suspicion and awkwardness. Uh, but as we uh, we have a a silly icebreaker where uh, every table has a police officer at that table with the community members, and they compete against the other tables in a silly uh, a game uh, of of trivia. <laughs> and after that, the we have the meal, and by the end of the evening, we get a group photo uh, shoot. And it's like a big family reunion. People are hugging and, and loving each other. And St. Louis, the last time, this dear saint of woman, and she's elderly and she's gotten shorter over the years. And she walks up to this this hulk of a white guy, cop, and she hugs him. And she says, now, sweetie, you be careful because it's dangerous out there. Wow. wow. And it's it is we see that time and time again. What have you seen in the in, inside the precincts, uh, whether it's Stanford or can you relate anything that's happening with the officers themselves as they're out there sharing their life with these people that uh, hated them maybe a week ago? Yeah, Stanford itself has always had a tremendous relationship with the community, but in several of the communities, uh, the I have heard police officers say, I've never done anything like that. And I had no idea the people in this community were so warm. If we have time, there's a, a wonderful story I love to tell. In uh, happened in Stanford, uh, uh, African American lady that I had worked with the year before in, in an event. She came up to me afterwards and she said, "Rev, Rev, I've got to tell you something." And I said, "What?" She said, "I was working next to uh, one of the guys. I thought he was a building contractor that was brought in to assist. But as we're working, I see he's got a SWAT cap on." And I said, are you a SWAT guy? And he said, yes, ma'am, I am. I says, but you're not me. <laughs> oh, bless her and heart. And he laughed and said, no. Oh, wow. And she said, I thought all SWAT guys were me. And she said, ma'am, that's only when we're in a situation where we've got to use that kind of force. Mm -hmm. And her words to me, I'll never forget. She said, Rev, that totally changed my perspective on police officers. Well, hopefully uh, the community starts seeing law enforcement officers as, as peacemakers and not just law enforcers, but they'll begin to see them as peacemakers and, and, and members of their own community. That is my prayer. Uh, one of the things that I desire civilians to know mm -hmm. is that police officers are some of the warmest, most compassionate individuals I've ever met. And I've worked with a lot of people. I don't know of any other group of people who daily are willing to go out and sacrifice themselves, even lose their own lives for the sake of the well-being of the people and even for those who despise them. That takes a special kind of person. Well, you've, you've seen them in some of the most tragic and some of the most traumatic situations, and you've seen how, you know, the, the real life of, of, of all first responders, EMTs, police officers. Mm -hmm. Firemen, how, how do you feel and what is it, how does it make you feel when you see the current portrayal of, of police in, in, our, in our national media? Well, honestly, it is frustrating uh, because so much of what's being put out there is a broad generalization based on the actions of a few. Every police officer that uh, I've spoken with shares my outrage at what happened to George Floyd. And one of the phrases that uh, has surfaced during that is nobody hates a bad cop more than a good cop. But what is sometimes lost in all of the emotion, and I understand the emotion. Like I said, growing up in Mississippi, I understand that uh, that overt racism and bigotry is a real situation and that there are people who actually think that way. But it's not accurate to superimpose that that image unto all police officers. There are, 
I've done the numbers. I've got the statistics. There are, uh, by cons- the most conservative standards, 700,000 full-time sworn officers in the United States. And the Washington Post has been compiling the records over the last few years. And again, the Washington Post is no bastion of conservative ideology by no, any means. Not. But in 2018 and 19, I'm sorry, they don't have 19 yet, 2017 and 18, in both years, close to 1,000 people died because of gunshots from police officers. Now, those 700,000 officers have millions of interactions with civilians each week. Tens of millions, if not upwards of 100 million interactions with civilians on an annual basis. That means that 99 point about 8 percent of police officers have never fired their weapon at another individual. And what is not being portrayed in the media is the countless times where police officers have gone out of their way to help someone, a person of color, in a time of need. That doesn't make the media. That doesn't no, make the not good news. It, it's not no. sensational. Mm-hmm. But just in mm-hmm. our area, I could fill up pages and pages of situations where police officers have volunteered their time to improve the well-being of people of color out of love and compassion, not because they're getting paid for it. That, that's just not making the media. With what we're seeing now with defund the police, uh, get rid of the police, things like that, uh, we could look at a lot of early retirements. We could be losing a lot of good veterans. We could be losing a, a, a lot of people who are doing a great job out on the streets. But there are still men and women signing up. There are still cadets coming into the, into the, into the, the academies. How do, you, how do you balance all that? That, that, that uh, desire to serve is still there. I had uh, dinner with a young man uh, the other day, and uh, he's interested in becoming a, a police officer. Uh, he's African-American. Uh, he's in his mid-20s. And I said, are you crazy? <laughs> he said, I just, I really feel it's what the Lord wants me to do. And the New Haven Police Department, uh, a few weeks back, uh, launched their new class of cadets, uh, about 18, and they asked me to pray over them at the swearing-in. And I was just, as I was praying, I was impressed. These are incredible people who are willing to enter into this most difficult time and serve in the truest sense of the word. Yeah, well, you've said that... uh... This is a quote, I think. Uh, if first responders are, are not called for, uh, are not cared for, the potential risk for society is particularly ominous. If they go down, we all go down. How, how, do, we, how do we turn the tide? How do we pray for first responders right now? Because you see what's going on in New York City, in different places where they defunded the police by a billion dollars in, one, in, in New York. And we, we're going to see, a, we already see, seen a big increase in crime. How do we pray, pray for first responders? How do we see this tide turn nationally? Well, I think it's uh, important for citizens to fulfill their role as citizens, to uh, stay on top of their state legislators and their city uh, elected officials and make sure that their elected officials are uh, are making decisions based on data and mm. real facts, not emotion, not on emotional reaction. Yeah. And Christians have the opportunity to do that. I believe Christians should do that. Uh, but I think that Christians can play a role. The church can play a role in encouraging police officers. Uh, when you see a police officer, uh, walk up to them and thank them for their willingness to sacrifice. Uh, have your church or a few individuals get together and buy lunch for the department and say it's on us. We've we're praying for you. We've got your back. But the I think what you mentioned, prayer is one of the most important things. Pray for their physical, emotional, and spiritual well-being. Pray for peace. Uh, that's something that I think we overlook. It's appropriate for us to pray for peace and pray that God would use these dark times to usher in his light so that 
those who are in need can see the hope that is found through Jesus. Right. Well, something else you're doing to, uh, to raise funds in, in particular for uh, Lifeline Chaplaincy. I think we, we need more police chaplains just like yourself. But you've created a, a series of books, uh, and this, this particular one I just read on uh, the testimony of Rahab, Yet I Will Rejoice. It's, it's a good, quick read because it is an encouragement to people that are going through tough, difficult, and sometimes chaotic times. Uh, there's a whole series of these, right, John? That's right. Um, this is something that I started 18 years ago and then I, I shelved. And once uh, COVID started to uh, unfold, I thought, well, maybe I should bring it out. And then things have gotten even more intense uh, in recent days. Uh, but what struck me about these is that these five in individuals, Rahab, and next is Gideon. I hope to release mm -hmm. Gideon this fall. Then Jehoshaphat, Isaiah, and Habakkuk. All five were in very precarious situations, some life-threatening. Uh, Isaiah was not in a life-threatening situation uh, and when we're covering his story, but the nation of, of uh, Judah was in a very precarious situation. And each one of them faced some very daunting prospects and scenarios. And in each one, there are clear lessons of hope and faith and deliverance. And so I thought perhaps this would be a source of encouragement for uh, brothers and sisters in Christ. But also, you know, honestly, I, I've never been a big fan of asking people for money. And if, if the purchase of a product can go to help fund a ministry, I'm all about that. So we started Lifeline Press as an extension of Lifeline Ministry to start producing and releasing these books. Well, this is the first one out, and like I say, it was a, it was a good, it was a fast read. I, I think I read that on Sunday afternoon. It was very encouraging. And this one is, is Rahab, and if you know the story of, of uh, Jericho, this is, a, this is a good one. It will encourage you. But John, uh, how soon will the rest of them be out, and uh, how, how, can they, uh, how, how can somebody get the whole set? Well, I'm, again, I'm hoping to have uh, Gideon out this fall, and then I'd like to get the other three out next year. But uh, all of them... Rahab is currently, and they all will be available through your major uh, internet outlets, uh, Amazon, Books A Million, uh, Barnes & Noble, Walmart, Target. Uh, they're all, you look up the, the book. If you just type in Rejoice and then mm -hmm. Rebel, you'll find it in, in all of those options. I would encourage you to be praying for our first responders every day. They place their lives on the line daily for our families. And don't forget, Viewpoint is supported by your gifts. I would appreciate you not only telling your friends about the program, but also helping us with the gift so we can continue to produce more programs like this. Thank you for joining me. Remember, you can watch the interviews you've seen today on demand on YouTube. Plus, you can also listen to all of our episodes on the Viewpoint with Bob Placey podcast on Apple, Spotify, and anywhere you listen to a podcast. <laughs>